Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. We are talking about um, women's preventative health. And I love talking about women's health as a like a holistic system instead of just summing it up to our the parts of our body and uh, making it bikini medicine. And we call it bikini medicine because, you know, usually the focus is just on the breast and the ovaries and um, it ignores the rest of women's health and and honestly the like our brain health affects our brace breast health our our gut health can affect our hormone health so we're all connected and hopefully today's presentation will show you how and give you lots of tips on how to take care of your health um, holistically um, so you could feel good and thrive um, so I'll do a screen share start here There we go. Um, okay, there we go. All right. So, um, woman, this is my nutritionist guide to women's preventative health. Um, and my name is Yamisha Gandhi. I am a functional and Ayurvedic nutritionist. In my practice, I actually focus on um, all the way from preteen to perimenopause, really focus, focus on um, the female body and uh, the female system. But I have lots of experience um, working on gut health as well. And I really believe that our bodies are resilient um, and we have the ability to recover and heal ourselves if we're given the proper tools. Um, and just to kick us off, this beautiful quote by Michelle Obama, communities and countries and ultimately the world are only as strong as the health of their women. This is such a powerful quote, especially in October, Breast Cancer um, Awareness Month, because, you know, um, did you know only, only 1993 women were included in health studies? So up until 1993, researchers were not required to include women, um, yet they were producing medication for women and coming up with ideas about women's health without actually studying them. So um, we have a long ways to go and we have overcome, we have achieved so much in just the last decade when it comes to women's health research. Um, and we can't talk about women's health without talking about menstrual cycle, um, the big taboo that people are so often ashamed to talk about in public, but really we, we have to address menstrual, the menstrual cycle, menstrual health, um, because it does make up a big component of uh, the female body and the female health. So, you know, women have about 450 periods um, during their lifetime. And um, what's surprising is that menarche, the age at which periods first begin is beginning at a much younger age now. So um, just 30 years ago, periods, the average age was about like 10 or 12. Um, and now the average age is becoming eight. And, it, um, and we're seeing menarche um, earlier, earlier in black and brown girls. Um, and, and we're not quite sure of the reasons why as a holistic nutritionist, I have some idea about why menarche is hitting us a lot quicker now. Um, and menopause is on the flip side, menopause is happening at a much older age. So um, I really do believe that there's a lot in our environment and our society that is playing a role, mainly stress. And so we have to be more mindful about how much, um, how we take care of our bodies. One, another fact is 11,000 tampons um, is the average number that a woman uses in a lifetime. That's a lot of tampons. And um, tampons are mostly plastic and a lot of chemicals. And we have to kind of wonder about um, that and how much that will um, plays a role in, in our health and in the health of our environment. Some other menstrual facts 
uh, a menstrual, menstrual cycle facts is that the menstrual cycle is known as the fifth vital sign. So, you know, your pulse, your heart rate, your temperature, um, those are all vital signs that, you know, when you go into the doctor's office, the nurse takes your vital signs um, and then writes it down. And it's a measure of how your health is doing. Well, your menstrual cycle is a measure of your health. So a few years ago, they included this in um, um, the American Gynecology Association included the menstrual cycle as another vital sign. So your doctors and your nurse should be asking you about your period during your checkups. Like, how's your period? What's the color of your period? Has anything changed? Is there clots? You know, these are all good um got good indicators about the health of your entire body. So what I mean by that is like, if you're, if your blood is um, really dark brown all the time, that means it's old blood. Um, that means it's been oxidized. So um, maybe you're not flushing everything out during each men menstrual cycle. If you have a lot of clots, clots um, can be an indication that um, you might have fibroids or again, something else is going on. The level of pain. I mean, if you're in excruciating pain, um, the doctor needs to do more than just give you um, a prescription for Midol and, um, you know, bad rest. Like what's behind that pain? You know, is it, is it nutritional deficiencies? Is it endometriosis? Is it something else deeper? Um, cause, because periods and pain are not normal. They're very common. So that's how um, the menstrual cycle acts as a vital sign of what else is going on in your body. Just like a raise in temperature indicates fever, which could indicate infection. Um, our menstrual cycle is also related to the rest of our health, meaning the younger we are, um, and when we first hit menarche, um, it increases our risk of um, heart attacks. So just by knowing that, um, we can take extra care of our health. Or when we go into the doctor's office at the age of 30, they should start screening you um, just by the fact of what age you started your period. Um, you know, and we like to villainize estrogen, especially during breast cancer awareness month, but estrogen plays a very important role in our health throughout our lifetime from when we start our period to um, menopause and um, estrogen or estradiol is a type of estrogen actually uh, boosts our memory. It boosts our um, ability to think clearly, um, make decisions. So we want estrogen just in the right form and the right amount. And, um, and so our hormones play a very important role. And if we are not having he healthy menstrual cycles, that means that there is something going on with our hormones. We may be producing too little or too much estrogen. We, not, we may not be producing enough progesterone, or we might have enough progesterone, but have too much estrogen. So it causes a imbalance between, between the two, or there might be something else going on with like testosterone or LH. I mean, insulin, these are all hormones that affect us. And, um, fluctuations in ovarian hormones are associated with menstrual cycling effect um, breast cancer susceptibility. So that means obviously if our estrogen is not in balance, it might increase our chances of breast cancer or other breast health um, concerns. So there are four phases of our menstrual cycle. Um, oftentimes people think of the menstrual cycle as either you're on your period or you're not on your period, but actually there's a lot that goes on in your body day to day. And um, it starts with the menstrual uh, phase, which is um, days, basically days one through five, six, seven, depends on how the length of your period. Some people get their periods for three or four days, some get for seven, eight. Um, and then um, you move into your follicular phase, which is let's say day seven to 14. Um, you ovulate just on one day, but you can get pregnant about um, your, your chances of getting pregnant in a month um, is about five or six days because that 
estrogen, which we need. Um, estrogen also acts as a lubricant. Um, it's our, you know, makes us feel ready to have sex and um, be intimate. And so sometimes if we don't have enough estrogen, then we experience vaginal dryness. And um, that can also then, you know, make sex more painful. Um, but what that estrogen release in um, before our ovulation phase does is that it actually acts um, that mucus, it gets, we get a lot of mucus and, um, you know, our, the consistency of our fluid is almost becomes like egg white fluid. And the purpose of that is to basically trap the sperm so you can get pregnant. So um, ovulation can happen anywhere like like four or five days before the actual release of the egg and then one day after the release of the egg. Um, and your chances of getting pregnant after this phase is very slim to none unless you have a regular period. So obviously you need to be tracking when you ovulate if you're trying to avoid pregnancy or achieve pregnancy. And then you hit your luteal phase, which lasts anywhere um, from 12 to 14 days um, until you get your period. And the luteal phase is the infamous phase where, you know, we talk about PMS and being moody and having all these symptoms. Um, and this is when your progesterone is rising and so is your estrogen, but not, uh, but your progesterone should be a little bit higher in this phase. And, the, and that's the, that's the whole month. <laughs> I say women are different, a different person every single day because their hormones are constantly changing. They're at a different day of their cycle. Um, and it's actually really beautiful. We can really honor these different phases and op to optimize our energy, cognition, relationships, and well-being. This is something I really practice on. Uh, it, uh, harp on and practice in my own nutrition practice is um, this menstrual cycle awareness and how to really um, take charge of it. You know, for so long, women have been shamed and put down for their menstrual cycle, but it's a really powerful tool to take care of our lives. And um, the idea is called moon cycle mapping. Um, but so the, there's such an importance on the menstrual cycle. And then after, you know, we're done with our, our, our fertile phase and we uh, hit uh, perimenopause. And perimenopause is when we are um, you know, our periods are changing where our body is actually getting ready for menopause and perimenopause can last about 10 years, but it doesn't have to be an awful experience if we start taking care of our bodies. And, and, and I'm just laying the foundation right now and I'm gonna talk about how we can take care of our bodies. So then we move into more of the perimenopause and the menopausal phase um, of our, our lives. Um, and I love this quote by Oprah Winfrey. So many women I've talked to see menopause as an ending, but I've discovered this is your moment to reinvent yourself after years of focusing on the needs of everyone else. It's your opportunity to get clear about what matters to you and then to pursue that with all of your energy, time, and talent. So really menopause is not the end of life for women. It's really just the beginning of a new chapter, a new journey, maybe even a new book. Um, and menopause, just like um, the menstrual phase and every other phase, we need to focus on nutrition, lifestyle, and environment. We are very susceptible to... Um, all humans are very susceptible to um, these factors. They really are the pillars of our lives that make keep us healthy. Um, but in women's health, we, what we want to focus on when it comes to nutrition is really minimizing um, extra sugar, you know, sugar that comes in Coca-Cola and and um, drinks and in beverages, you know, and then also like processed foods, like cereals, even if the cereal is marketed as being whole grain and super healthy, um, all of the processed foods, we really want to minimize that in the added sugars. Sh sugar feeds cancer. <laughs> cancer loves sugar. Cancer loves processed foods, and it will grow with that. And so, you know, if we are at risk for, um, if we are at risk for heart disease, for breast cancer, um, you know, we're having infertility issues. We really wanna watch how much sugar we're consuming. 
The next thing is including a lot of probiotic rich foods in our diet. So probiotics um, feeds our gut microbiome. It feeds our uh, immune system. It makes up, you know, it can, uh, probiotics is like the food for our brain and our gut. So we really want to include that. And probiotic rich foods includes things like you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickled foods, um, anything fermented. Healthy fats. So for so long, women have been told to go fat-free, right? <laughs> Especially in the 80s and the 90s where the fat-free craze was an all-time peak. Um, but we have found that healthy, um, being completely fat-free in our diet is actually very detrimental and can um, increase the risk of other health issues. So, um, you know, if you have a low body fat um, and you're not consuming any fat, you can experience amenorrhea, which is where you don't even get your period or very irregular cycles. So what um, healthy fats like olives, olive oils, nuts and seeds, um, coconut oil, grass-fed butter, ghee, all those are considered healthy fats and our horm it's food for our hormones. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily make us fat. You know, what makes us fat gain weight is that excess sugar and the processed oils like canola oil, deep fried things, baked goods. Um, that's the issue, not necessarily the healthy fats. In fact, lots of studies have shown that, you know, just eating an, like an avocado a day um, and that takes the place of like a bagel or something, um, you can actually start losing weight. Um, as you get older and older, focusing mostly on plant-based foods. So this is very age-based. Uh, I feel um, a lot of people trying to con uh, conceive and all, or just get healthy periods and ovulate should be consuming um, um, a very omnivorous diet, getting um getting nutrients from animal-based foods too. And like things like um, if you can tolerate a really healthy dairy and um, eggs and such. But as you get older and hitting menopause, um, transitioning mostly to plant-based can be very healthy because it has all that fiber and it has all the correct rich foods that we need and all the antioxidants and minerals. And we don't need so much of the, the fat and cholesterol that comes from animal-based foods as we get older, but it is very important for, um, for you know, the 20s, 30s, and 40s to still consume um, a healthy, balanced, um, omnivorous diet. As you get older, you wanna focus on warm, fresh, and light foods. Um, so avoiding like late night steaks and maybe saving the steak for the afternoon meal. Um, really, you know, avoiding a lot of cold foods. Your digestive enzymes actually decrease as you get older. So you want um, to make the process easier for your digestive system. So raw food is a lot harder on your digestive system than cooked food. Colder foods are a lot harder on your digestive system than warmer foods. Um, and then lifestyle, we want to really focus on what our healthy lifestyle is, you know, um, strength training. So keeping uh, up with our healthy muscles, like, so you don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to be a bodybuilder, but just, you know, maybe like having um, 10, you know, like five pound, 10 pound dumbbells around and doing like a rep or two reps daily, just to keep your healthy muscles going, climbing the stairs, doing squats, all those things are going to keep your hip, your joints, um, you know, your wrists um, healthy and strong, because as we get older, our risk of uh, breaking a bone and never recovering goes up uh, dramatically. You know, you, you know, um, you fall in your 20s, you break your wrist, and then you're good to go in a couple of months. But um, as you get older, and you don't have the right muscles, you're not strong enough, you may never recover. You know, we all know of someone who's like fallen down, and then they're not, they have to use a walker for the rest of their lives. So strength training is super important, keeping up healthy muscles. Community is really important, too, because, you know, um, 
the Surgeon General said loneliness is um, the new smoking. It's the, uh, one of the number one leading causes of illness in um, America. And so it's the having relationships, having your best friends, your just community members, like going to church or, or um, you know, going to your yoga class where you see the same people over and over again and, and feel a sense of community, that's, that's really important. Resting. You know, we power through our lives and not take enough time to rest, but there's so much healing and resting, um, especially we, as we get older and engaging in joy. And our environment is equally important. Um, you know, trying to spend more time in nature, keeping our mind and our environment, our space calm and peaceful and doing anything that makes you feel good and powerful. There are no limitations. You could be 65 and bungee jumping. You could be 20 and uh, reading books on the couch. You know, whatever makes you feel good and powerful. There are no limitations. Um, yeah. And um, so then now I'm going to move on to some of the things that really impact women's health, like breast health. So early detection, um, you know, we hear about, oh, you must do early detection, early detection. There's lots of ways um, that include self, a monthly breast self exams, scheduling regular clinical breast exams and mammograms. There's also another technique called thero, uh, heat therography. I've done it. It's really cool. Um, my friend did it for me because she owns it. It's, um, it's, not painful at all, but it, it, it recognizes heat patterns in your body, which can um, help you detect breast cancer as well and other cancers in your body. It's a less adapted technology, but it is um, very accurate. Um, so if you're like, you know, for some reason, mammograms, you just can't do that. I've had a mammogram too. It's very painful. <laughs> so, you know, it's not as appealing, but there are other options. I had a quick question uh, on that, um, the yeah. um, the, 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 this use of that. I act, it's actually becoming more and more important because isn't, I would suggest that um, inflammation really starts showing up in breast cancer very early and you'll pick that up on a thermograph through heat. Inflammation is always coming up hot and redder. So it's a very easy way to kind of say, is there something really a brew here? You know. Yeah, so your mammogram might show like everything is fine, but that thermograph might show that, oh no, there, there's a pattern happening here. Um, unfortunately, it's not as well adapted and a lot of doctors don't know how to read the results of it. So you have to go to a specialist, but um, if you look it up and you have the ability to get a thermograph done, I say get one done yearly if you can, because not it's not only just for breast health, you can look at gut health, you can look at your thyroid, your neck, your heart. Um, it's really cool. And it's not invasive and it's not that expensive. Yeah, it's literally like standing in front of like a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it <laughs> it's like it's less painful than an x-ray you know um it's really cool um people when, sorry when do you suggest that we that you know women start to get the mammograms because I've been told I you know like at one point people were telling me you know around 35 you should start to to try to like schedule but then some doctors are telling me you shouldn't start until 40. So yeah, I, I think, yeah, yeah. You know, it, the, I think do, it's kind of mixed. Like there is no hard consensus. Like, but if you do go on to like, um, like CDC and, um, you know, breastcancerawareness.org, um, usually they say, get one, get a, a mammogram one to to one to three years from ages 25 to 39. Um, so, you know, between ages is 25 to 39, just having like at least three mammograms in that uh, time frame. Also, if you breast cancer runs in your family or you did a genetic testing and you have the BRCA genes or um, the, you know, any other genes that indicate that you might develop breast cancer, be on it and get one every year if your insurance will allow it. You know, um, I think 
I think That's you're what I've been asking from since I turned from since I was 25 because I'm now 33 and you know like I always ask them you know what is the age should I start should I try to schedule something just to check I don't know and then it's like like I said like everybody gives me different yeah I think we just, and well, the last time they told me 40 so that's why I'm like I don't know <laughs> yeah well you know I think you should just get one and say no I'm demanding this and if you have especially a, a like a solid reason like your mom had breast cancer your grandmother or your aunt you know whoever in your family and or um there are a lot of people in your community have breast cancer because there is some correlation of like you know pockets of community like um it just seems like everyone in that community had breast cancer or breast cancer scare and um that's where i think like environment plays a role so if you know a lot of people getting breast cancer that might be a, a sign for you to get tested you know um and just be aggressive about it i don't i know some doctors are like oh no you're too young you don't need to but um the you know the likelihood of early detection, like if you detect breast cancer early on, your survival rate is 99%. So there's no reason to not get that preventative measure done. And then again, if you, if no one will do it for you, or your insurance won't cover it, you could go find someone who does a thermography and um, detect your, you know, just get that kind of done and then have a doctor analyze that for you it's usually the person who does the thermography will have a list of doctors that they work with and just so you know what your risks are and um and then do some genetic testing if you can but after you turn 40 you should get a breast exam a mam a breast exam and a mammogram every one to two years after 40. Um, but before 40, maybe one to three years. And then breast exams, it's so there's there's a self breast exam that you could do on yourself every month um, in about like three to five, like about, almost about a week before your period or anywhere in that week before your period, do a breast exam because that's the best time to tell if there are going to be any changes. Like it looks red, it looks lumpy, it looks, it feels really hot or dense or itchy. You know, all of those could be signs of something. It may not be, it could just be PMS, but doing an exam every month um, on yourself. And I have a video and a sheet on how to do that. Um, that can really help you. Um, so that's one, and you can do that every month and you don't need your doctor to do that. And then when you have your yearly checkup, um, have your doctor do a, a breast exam so they can palpate you and uh, maybe they can detect something that you might have missed, you know, um, and then having that mammogram. So even if you don't do a mammogram um, right away, you have these other tools on hand as well. And then how to take care of your breast health. You know, there's a lot we can do. Breast cancer just doesn't happen and we can really prevent um, we may not always be able to prevent breast cancer, you know, especially if genetically, um, the, uh, the, you know, you have two of the genes or something, but there is a lot we can do to take care of ourselves, like massaging our breasts daily. So in Ayurvedic and Eastern medicine, they talk about massaging your body daily, touching yourself daily, just to like feel your arms, your skin, um, you know, being, like being friends with your own body so you know that things are changing also and how to you know approach your health in that way so that also includes massaging your breast daily and if you can't massage your breast daily at least do it um once a month in that luteal phase and that breast massage can also become a self-exam breaking a sweat exercising is so important so you know when we exercise we have a lot of lymph nodes in our breast area our lymph nodes it's kind of like um where our immune system is but it's also like our our uh, drainage system and if we're not exercising we're not sweating everything is building up so we really want to sweat it out you could sweat it out by going to the sauna, taking a hot bath, or just exercising. And then there's so many benefits of exercising and using the sauna too. Performing a seasonal cleanse. And so I'm not talking about going on a, a, like a, a, a week-long liquid diet. I never recommend that. But like maybe like once a, once a season, you can give up 
give up one of your vices, whether it's coffee, chocolate, cookies, you know, and kind of cleansing out, giving your body to reset alcohol, you know, those are some common things that people want to reset from. So, um, you know, doing like a three to five day seasonal cleanse where you're not, you're not starving, you're not like um, fasting, but you're just kind of taking a break from certain foods that might be causing issues for you and really um, and during the seasonal cleanse, like maybe consuming extra green juices or extra um, bitters to give your liver that boost because our liver is our detox organ as well. Staying hydrated is so important because again, we're flush out toxins from our body. We, um, you know, we also help our lymphatic nodes and lymph nodes when we stay hydrated. Avoid commercial deodorant. I mean, this is a big topic, but you really do want to avoid things and toxins in your body, um, putting it directly. And the what the thing with the with the um, the deodorant is it's, it's an armpit so close to our breast, and our armpits have the that lymph those lymph nodes. You know, um, I should actually include a picture of that next time, but. Um, that connects directly to our breast. So if we're putting toxic ingredients, like especially aluminum, which has been linked to breast cancer right here, that's, it's like we're feeding, <laughs> we're feeding toxins in our body. We're feeding the bad cells in our body. So, you know, there are a lot of natural deodorants. I say reserve the heavy duty deodorants for like when you're going to a wedding, a wedding or an important event, but if you're just at home, you may not need that deodorant. You know, if you're just going to run to the grocery store, maybe try a natural deodorant if you need it. And that's another indication of health. If your armpits, it's natural to sweat, like we're supposed to sweat. You know, again, if we're um, using antiperspirants, that means we're blocking out the sweat, and so we're block we're trapping the toxins. But if your sweat is really stinky and smelly and uncomfortable, that's an indication of something that's in your body that's health that, you know, what, maybe they're not detoxing. Maybe it's something related to your gut. And how can we get rid of that odor by taking care of our health and asking why. Practicing yoga, there are lots of wonderful yoga poses for breast health. There's a form of yoga called Yoni Shakti also that's really for the female body. Um, pooping daily, this is another important part of um, breast health um, because you know we release estrogen when we poop. Reducing xenoestrogens, that means reducing um, estrogen that comes in through their environment by basically plastics, um, um, pesticides on our food, processed foods, um, and toxic air. Um, Nancy, do you think we have time for this video? Because I've have so much more to go through. We have about 20 minutes. I'm not too sure if you feel the video can connect it. Okay, let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. Okay, this is just how to do a breast self exam. The risk of getting breast cancer and the chances of developing it increases with age. <laughs> but we also know that early detection can save lives. Empower yourself and the women you love with the gift of early detection. Here's how to do it. Here's how you can conduct breast self examination or BSE in short. If you're menstruating, do the BSE seven to 10 days after the start of your menstruation. It's simple. Just give your breasts some TLC. Touch, look, check. Begin by lying on your back. Place your right hand behind your head. With the pads of the middle index and ring fingers of your left hand, gently get firmly press down using small motions to examine the entire right breast. Use any of the following patterns you're most comfortable with to ensure you've covered all the breast tissue. Next, sit or stand and feel your armpit because breast tissue extends to that area. Gently squeeze the nipple, checking for discharge. Repeat the process on the left breast. Now, Stand in front of the mirror with your arms by your side. Look at your breasts directly and in the mirror. 
look out for the signs of breast cancers, which include one, a painless lump in the breast or armpit, two, rashes around the nipple, three, discharge from the nipple, four, changes in the skin over the breast or nipple, five, retraction or pulling in of the nipple. Also note the shape and the outline of each breast. Check to see if the nipple turns inward. Do the same with your arms raised above your head. If you find changes or anything new in consecutive self-examinations, highlight it to your healthcare provider right away. They will then advise you of the next steps forward. Breast self-examination, just 15 minutes each month, can save lives and breasts. Be proactive about your health. BSE should always be coupled with regular mammogram screening for your age group. Help spread the word to all women you love. Encourage and remind them to take precautions suitable for their age. For more information about BSE, log on to www.bcf.org.sg. Okay. So that was, um, that was a really great video. Um, and so there's a lot we could talk about breast health, but I wanted to, because we are focusing on women's preventative health, I want to move on to different areas. And honestly, they are all connected. I mean, if we take care of our gut health, we are in a way taking care of our breast health and, and so on. So I wanted to talk about gut health and why gut health is so important. So we've, you know, and in this, um, for your group, I've talked about gut health many times, but just as a reminder, our gut is the home of very large number of microbes, co collectively known as the gut microbiota. Um, and that this microbiota does a lot for our body. And um, as the gut microbiota exerts various effects on the um, in our intestines, in our body, which influ it influences distant organs like our breasts, um, like our heart, like our brain, and is considered to be a full-fledged endocrine organ. So, um, you know, it plays an important role in regulating nearly every hormone in the body, which includes your thyroid hormones, cortisol, insulin, progesterone, estrogen, and melatonin. Um, so if our gut health is off, that means we might be, um, not producing enough melatonin. We might, um, have estrogen, um, dominance. We might have, um, we might not be, uh, producing enough thyroid T3, T4 hormones. Um, and so then you can see how that can be related to breast health as well. You know, 75, about 75% 75 of your immune system is in the gut, 90% of serotonin, the feel good hormone is produced in the gut. So um, imbalance of the gut microbiota um, can lead to several diseases and conditions. Um, and one of them, you know, I'm, you know, there are a, a small studies showing the influence of gut health on breast health. And this is again, um, not, you know, this is an area of women's health that's again, not researched too much, like how gut health influences women's health. Um, and I'm hoping that will change in the near future. Brain health is a number is another big topic for women's health. When we talk about brain health, you know, the focus has really been on men's health. And until I started um, really doing my own research, I always thought Alzheimer's was a old man's disease. I really did. Just like I, that's what I thought about heart disease. And, um, uh, but the, the facts are that 70% of Alzheimer's surf, surf, uh, sufferers are women, 70% um, are women. And um, we think that it has to actually be, uh, it may be linked to also um, estrogen. And it might be linked to also inflammation and gut health. So, you know, this is a very important finding. Um, there's, there is some more research now going into looking at women specifically and brain health. So, um, you know, cognitive decline doesn't have to be your story though. It's not something that happens to everyone in old age. We can really take care of our health by addressing the gut brain connection, you know, getting more fiber in our diet, um, all the food things, I, the nutrition tips I already just gave, all of that will take care of our brain health as well. Um, heart health, um, 
is also, you know, I was something that is perceived as something that impacts older men, but it actually does impact women um, equally. And um, younger and younger people are experiencing um, heart, heart health, cardiovascular health issues now. One in five women in the US die of cardiovascular disease. And it actually kills more women than breast cancer. So we do need a, more awareness about heart health and women's health. February is known as Heart Health Month. Um, and women are more likely to have atypical symptoms of a heart attack compared to men, including nausea, shortness of breath, fatigue, unexplained weakness, pain in upper back and neck, fainting, sense of foreboding, and general uh, feeling of unwellness. And how can we take care of our heart health, get regular tests done and advocate for my diagnostic tools? Like, you know, um, Melissa is just asking about um, mammogram exams. It's the same thing with heart health. We Women really have to go in with like a business mindset into the doctor's office and say, hey, I need these tests done and I need it done this year, you know? Increase omega-3 fatty acids and resistant starches. So lots of fiber, but omega-3 fatty acids that come like, you know, cold water fatty fish, like salmon, sardines, but also um, flax seeds and um, uh, chia seeds, hemp seeds. Those are all walnuts. Those are all um, helps you increase that omega-3 fatty acids, super healthy for you and heart protective. And um you know, actually, you know, you can also measure your heart health by your insulin too. So people who are more likely to have, um, who have like pre-diabetes and diabetes are more likely going to have heart health issues. So you could um, start understanding what your glucose levels are like. You could, you know, even use something for a little bit like call a continuous glucose monitoring system. Um, I think it's a uh, very preventative tools. Um, taking a magnesium glycinate and taurate supplement, about 600 milligrams a day is a calcium channel blocker. Magnesium is also great for balancing out your hormones, really great for breast health also. So um, I think it's kind of like a multivitamin, multimineral, just taking a magnesium glycinate and taurate. Um, the, there are many forms of magnesium, but the glycinate and taurate are very, um, those are the key forms to take for women's health. Um, oh, I think the slide got left off, but I, you know, I just say, uh, take um, a snapshot of this, basically you saw in the video, but this is how you could take a, a daily um, breast health massage. Um, you know, you don't have to be laying down, but um, this is more of like a spiritual practice too, by by, you know, taking some oil, be mentally grateful for the gift of your beautiful body from nature, relaxing, letting go of all noise in your mind um, for a few minutes and, and um, really going through this um, steps one through eight here um, for your breast health at least once a month. Um, and this isn't um, to uh, examine for, um, for anything, but really just connecting with your body and, and, you know, like the breast tissues, they go all the way up to the side of your um, chest, to your armpits. So, you know, massages are relaxing. So to take care of our health, what's the ideal diet? Um, you know, like I mentioned, we really want to focus on pl a plant-based diet, about six to nine cups of vegetables. And um, so that's about, you know, you're trying to aim for about 30, 32 grams of fiber a day. And this is what a plate, a healthy plate would look like. Your day, every meal should, uh, every major meal could should kind of look like this. Oh no, I don't know what happened. Do, do you still see the presentation? Oh, there we go. Okay, um, non-starchy veggies. Um, so, you know, like your leafy greens, your broccoli, the starchy veggies are like your sweet potatoes, uh, carrots, squashes, things like that. And whole grains would make up about 
20% of your plate, another 20% would be healthy fats. And then um, the next um, thing would be clean proteins um, that, you know, proteins really helps um, balance out blood sugar. It really helps you stay satiated longer. It's the building blocks, um, but you want to do clean protein. Like, so if you're eating meat, you want to make sure that it doesn't have any added hormones and chemicals and things like that added to it. Um, go for the organic grass fed stuff. Um, the tofu you're eating, making sure it's organic because non-organic tofu has been genetically modified and has lots of pesticides sprayed on it. Um, and that's really, you know, are the basics of an ideal diet for um, women's preventative health, but you can also fine tune it. You know, you want to focus on whole grains, uh, foods grown from the soil. So think like shopping at the farmer's market, you know, um, very minimal processed and fake foods or food-like substances, as Michael Pollan says. Um, and fruits are amazing. Let's not be scared of fruits. Um, and a circadian rhythm, that means following eating, um, you know, women tend to eat erratically. And so we want to eat at the same time every single day, breakfast relatively at the same time, let's say 8 a.m. every day breakfast. Because if we do one, um, you know, one day we'll eat at 8 a.m. and the next day we won't eat till like noon. And then the next day we won't eat until like maybe 10 a.m. Our body is doing a yo-yo too. And just like our sleep-wake cycles, we do have a hunger cycle. And so we wanna be predictable and um, save the stress for our body. Um, again, this is just an emphasis on the types of foods that you should be eating daily, like whole grains and legumes, herbs and spices, lots of protective ingredients in herbs and spices, cold water fatty fish, you know, for your omegas, nuts and seeds, seasonal fruits, healthy fats, vegetable and bone broths, and a variety of vegetables. And then we have, you know, these superfoods. And and for superfoods, we only need a little um, to get a lot out of them. And um, they are very expensive. So I think they are optional too. But just knowing that like, you know, you spend maybe $10 on a very high quality cacao, like for fair trade, no other ingredients, cacao, organic. But that that $10 bag should be lasting you for three, four months. So it stretches a long way because you only need like a tablespoon of it. You don't need to be having like a half a cup of cacao every day um, to get those protective benefits. Um, blueberries, one of the most um, brain protective, breast protective, hormone protective um, fruits in the world. Actually, they are starting to make supplements out of uh, blueberries for Alzheimer's and brain health that's so powerful. But I think having blueberries even like twice a week um, is sufficient. Um, there's so, you know, we don't need to take supplements yet. <laughs> goji berries, green tea. Green tea is very protective. It has L-theanine also, very rich in antioxidants. Um, and the traditional way of drinking green tea is like um, you, you use the same tea bag throughout the day, same day or the same tea leaves, right? So your first cup in the morning is the strongest. And by the time you have green tea by like five or 6 p.m., it's pretty weak in caffeine. And it's more just like, an antioxidant drink that you're drinking. Eggs are a pasture raised eggs are actually a complete uh, nutrient food and um, really wonderful source of protein and choline and healthy fats. Turmeric, you know, we've heard about turmeric as a spice, really wonderful. I say cook with turmeric versus just popping pills of turmeric, um, really add it into your diet and ferment it in food. tea. Yeah, turmeric I put, tea. I make it with like ginger tea. I put like the ginger and then I chop up some turmeric and um some cinnamon sticks and a bay leaf. And then <laughs> I just let it, Yeah. I just let it bubble. And then that burns out everything. <laughs> it opens yeah. up your, your, your smell, everything. Yeah, you know, turmeric is, um, that sounds like a very delicious tea actually. Does it taste like, good? Yeah, does it taste good what you make, Melissa? 
or is it more like I'm not a big tea person but like that's one thing that I've known that I've noticed like anytime like I have felt sick I've had like um you know like when you when winter time comes and you have that cold sitting on your chest and stuff like that that actually helped me and then one point it even helped me like I was I was having a bad toothache in the back over here and it kept swelling up and before I actually went to the dentist what I would do is I would make the tea drink it and then after maybe like an hour or so of drinking it and just letting it sit right there mm. felt better no more toothache yeah so turmeric is very powerful um it's been used in india for over five thousand years um it's it's a very powerful powerful um anti-inflammatory medicinal food spice and so there's so many ways to use it i think um, yeah, making it, you could even make it like a turmeric paste, you know, before girls and um, actually, yeah, before girls get married in India, they do a haldi ceremony, which is a uh, haldi means turmeric. And they, they make a face like paste out of, um, out of turmeric and they, they put, uh, and women in her community, the bride's community will like um, put turmeric all over her and bless her basically to give her that glow. I mean, turmeric is very powerful and used in so many ways. So I always say use the actual turmeric instead of just taking turmeric supplements, um, like put in your food, you know, put in your eggs. It, it, um, and um, yeah. So thanks for sharing that. That sounds delicious. So some supplements I want to talk about. Um, the supplement industry is really big. So you really want to check for quality and um, quality of your supplements because taking cheaper, poor quality supplements can actually make you sicker, um, can clog up your liver, clog up your lymph nodes. So it's going to have an opposite effect. You know, um, you don't want that. You want really clean um, safe hormones. I mean, supplements, um, especially for hormones. And this is my link where you can get high quality supplements that's been tested and regulated. Um, and for hormones specifically, I say focus on B complex vitamins, um, can help with headaches, can help with a lot of things. Magnesium, again, I think magnesium is a non-negotiable, <laughs> Um, I think, um, you know, like magnesium and vitamin D are just non-negotiables. Um, you could skip the multivitamin, but um, that magnesium is going to help with so many things. And then that vitamin D3 also just taking 2000 IUs for maintenance, maybe more. It just depends on your lab. But when you get your lab testing done, go get uh, vitamin D3, not D2 tested. Omega-3 fatty acids, um, like about 1500 milligrams of EPA, DHA. Then you can get really specific. There's Shatavri, Vitex, flax seeds, DIM. Um, it really depends on what your body needs. So like flax seeds improves gut health, insulin levels, eliminates harmful estrogens. But you don't want to take flax seeds, Vitex, Chitavri, and DIM all at once because that's overload. You only need one of these. So being very careful and being very selective of what you choose. Um, a quick question on the DIM. Uh, I just was uh -huh. reading about that and its relationship to all kinds of women's health, breast cancer, all these different things or preventative uh -huh. stuff. Um, but it, I guess the focus of that, as you mentioned, was to help detoxify and eliminate excess estrogen out of the body, uh, the inappropriate Type. Now, you mentioned estro one type um, estradiol yeah that that's the protective one but the pernicious ones are what are they um the other forms of estrogen estrogen estradiol est uh, it's escaping me but there are lots of forms of estrogen and you know what one thing i want to say about dim dim is a is an ingredient that naturally um, you can get from cruciferous vegetables like mm -hmm. cauliflower, broccoli, kale, that naturally has it. So having at least one serving of a cruciferous vegetable daily, like Brussels sprouts, um, I think is essential. One, just one serving a day. And then going back to this, like, um, again, all of them, Vitex, Black Seeds, Dim, they all um, try to 
um, balance out your estrogen by getting rid of the harmful estrogen. So again, you don't want to take them all at once. And I think it's important to understand what's happening in your body. So a lot of people think like, oh, I have es excess estrogen. I'm just going to take uh, Vitex or DIM. But if you get your blood tested and um, you may actually have, it's not that you don't have, you might actually have low estrogen, um, but it presents because the symptoms are kind of similar from low or high estrogen. But it's important to know because then if you take these supplements, you might be really getting low. Then you know, and and um, um, your symptoms might worsen your other symptoms like PMS and um, and you know like vaginal dryness and things. So you want to just get tested, test not guess. <laughs> Um, and um, making sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, I know we only, like we're at the top of the hour, but I just wanted to, again, mention environmental toxins. Um, they, like, this is a picture of a woman. Um, I just pulled it on off of Google, but look at how many chemicals she puts on herself just before heading out of the house, um, you know, way over, 300 chemicals here, you know, just perfume alone, perfume alone has 250 chemicals. So um, we really want to minimize the use of products, um, go very natural as possible for moisturizing our body, like body lotion has 32 chemicals, maybe just using coconut oil or shea butter or almond oil instead to lubricate our skin, you know, or choosing lotion that is very, like only has like three or four ingredients, um, instead of 32, um, you know, using green beauty product labels, um, but you have to read the read the labels actually, and making sure like, again, deodorant has like supposedly three, 32 chemicals. So um, wanna really watch out for these environmental toxins and these external things that we put on our body that puts us at risk for getting sicker. Um, a lot of them are xenoestrogens as well, right? And a lot of them are xenoestrogens. Um, he, yeah, and these are things we want to avoid uh, for sure for our hormones, <laughs> our, our um, breast health, brain health, all of it. Plant therapy. So, you know, a lot of times we can't maybe control exactly what's in our environment, like if we're working in an office, but maybe we could bring a plant into our onto our desk because plants act as like um, air purifiers and um you know, one thing I think that came out of good out of COVID is the, the regular use of masks, because I say just use a mask when you are on the subway, when you are, um, you know, maybe like the air pollution is particularly bad in your neighborhood that day using a mask because that will protect you. Um, yeah, and we didn't talk much about exercise, but you know, I want I just want to say exercise is a celebration of what your body can do, not a punishment for what you ate. And and um, exercise is really it's a natural human thing to do. You know, before before our modern living, we were exercising every day by gardening, by walking to wherever we needed to go, by climbing rocks, you know, that was our natural way of living just to survive. And, um, and we need to kind of, that's why we have gyms and things, but we can go for walks and really just uh, move our bodies. And these are all the ways to connect with me and I can answer questions. I know we're over time, but we did also start a little late too. Yeah. I don't have any questions, Anisha. I just wanted to thank you for bringing up so many um, important topics regarding, you know, overall women's health, especially during um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I think there were so many things that spoke true to me a lot um, around, you know, the nutritional items that we put into ourselves. I think that does, for me, again, um, play a factor with, you know, the early menstruals. Um, I forgot the word that you use for it. This myarchy. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think that plays a real factor in, um, you know, the early um, periods for, for, especially in the black and brown communities. And you do see the disparaging amount of healthy foods in certain communities that aren't there versus in other communities. And I, I personally think that's what um, helps with that earlier um, promotion of myarchy for um, young black and brown girls. 
but so many things that you touched on, you know, the things that were, you know, the chemicals on the skin and even touching our skin, the importance of community. And there's so much on very communities throughout this world that we can find people, especially using the internet nowadays that have like interests like we do and just build our community around that. I think it's just key and the importance of exercise because we're in such a advanced state of the world where so many things are easier, we kind of forget that, you know, we used to go gardening or we used to go for longer walks than, you know, maybe now with, you know, certain transportation hubs. But uh, I think there's so many key items into this. I wanted to thank everybody, especially you, Namisha, for giving this presentation. I'm not too sure you didn't do the major introduction, but you are a functional medicine nutritionist, a Ayurvedic, I may not pronounce that right, counselor. Okay. You do, you know, Nidra yoga and meditation. You are a clinical researcher and tech founder. I don't know what, I feel the list goes on and on. <laughs> But I love the fact that you found, um, you put up the ways that we can contact you and gain further information about our health overall. So I thank you so much for joining us today and for another time with us. And we hope to have you back again to give us further information and education on overall health and wellness. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure speaking to your group, Sandrine, and um, I'll see you next time. We'll wow. see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Namisha. Thank you very much.